What is up, everybody? Chris of Midlife Crisis Media here. Welcome to the first in a long line of Film Collection 2024 live streams. So last week I concluded the video game live streams. I've been doing that for almost two years. It's crazy to think that I did that for almost two years. Goddamn. Talked about the PS5 games, last of my video game collection, you know, from oldest to newest. So now we're moving on to my film collection, which is not as big as my video game collection, but big nonetheless. It takes up a good portion of my living room. So I have multiple formats, and uh, I'm starting off tonight with the VHS and DVD movies in my collection, and then we'll move on to, I want to say next week we'll do TV shows on Blu-ray, move on to the box sets on Blu-ray, and then move on to all of my individual Blu-rays, and then go into 4K television shows, 4K box sets, and then my 4K collection. And it's going to be very, very long. And the thing is, I realized last time I did this a few years back, I put way too many movies in each stream. I talked about way too many movies. Uh, and those streams ended up being like three hours long each. And I would be hoarse the next day. So I'm going to pare them down a little bit and not talk about so many. Uh, starting off with tonight. So tonight I have, I know the title might be a little misleading. I know it's like VHS and DVD. I have one movie on VHS. One. And then we're going to talk about all the movies that I have on DVD, which aren't many. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of DVDs. I you know now that I you know have a 4K television, I prefer to watch everything in HD. So I have a lot of Blu-rays and a lot of 4Ks. The only reason I have these DVDs in my collection is because these are not available on physical media Blu-rays or 4K UHDs. So until that happens, until they do get a release, I will have these DVDs in my collection. Like I'll I'll spoil something. Uh, I've had a copy of The Abyss on DVD since it came out. What's up, Retro Coop? How's it going? I've had a copy of The uh, the Abyss on DVD because it never got a Blu-ray release. And the, the DVD that I had had the special edition, the long cut of the movie, the, the version that I like. So until we got a high-def copy of The Abyss, I was going to hang on to that DVD, especially because it came with the documentary that's almost as good as the movie on it uh, as an extra. Uh, well, guess what? The Abyss finally got a new home video release on 4K and Blu-ray, so guess what? The DVD can go now. So a little spoiler alert for the end-of-the-month pickup that you're going to probably see next week or the week after. I can't remember. Um, so we'll start off with the one VHS tape I have in my collection. And you're going to be seeing a lot of this movie throughout all of these streams. And if you know me, you can probably guess what it is. <laughs> it is... The clamshell edition of Tron, the original Tron from 1982. Uh, I have a Tron shrine in my living room. I have the movies, both movies, Tron and Tron Legacy, on multiple formats. Uh, I have comic books, books, storybooks, toys, soundtracks, uh, posters, signed, some not signed. Uh, action figures, I mean, just everything. Uh, it's everywhere. I have uh, stuff from Monster, the company that makes computer um, uh, computer accessories. I have like a mouse and a, 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 a dock for my iPod. Stuff like that. So one of my goals is to get at least one copy of Tron on every format that it was available on. That includes I'm trying to find a Laserdisc copy. I'm trying to find the SpectraVision uh, it's like a movie on vinyl, on a vinyl album, um, Betamax, that kind of thing. There's two editions of Tron on VHS. There's this clamshell, which is the one that you would see at the V8, at the uh, rental shops back in the day all the time. Uh, and then there's one that has just a slip, the cardboard slip. So I made a real effort trying to find this one. Luckily, it was not expensive. I think I got this during the pandemic off of eBay for like $20. And that's not bad. And it came in great shape. I love the artwork. I think this was the Japanese poster art because the art, the artwork that we got in the U.S. was basically just that shot of Tron with his like hands on his hips, and he was like all multicolored. We didn't get. I don't remember seeing this poster anywhere in the U.S., but I do enjoy it. It's on the storybook that I have and a couple of other items that I have. 
Uh, yeah, you can see the artwork we got on with Tron was this. The picture of him with the uh, his hands on his hips. And the VHS tape itself has a very long label on it that kind of goes past a little section where the label would normally fit. Uh, I have not watched it. I don't usually. I don't usually have my VHS player. I still do have a VHS player. I have, do not have it hooked up currently. Um, but the tape itself is in great shape. It doesn't look dinged up or banged up. It doesn't look like. Honestly, it doesn't look like anybody's ever watched this. And it's not like only a section of the plastic of the case is a little bit yellowed up here, but the rest of it is still white. Uh, I'm super happy that this came in such great shape. So, because this is the version, no, I never did own this version. Like I said, this is the one that you would always see at the video shops and the video store that I worked at in the mid '90s did have a copy in the clamshell. So, this is if I was going to get one on VHS, if I had the choice between this or the cardboard sleeve one, this is the one that I wanted. This one has the better artwork and uh, a little more substantial. And uh, then we're going to talk about the one single strange format I have Tron on currently. I'll be talking about these again in greater length when I do my Tron collection stream, which is going to be a long way down the road. Uh, but I, I did not remember that this was released on this format. I found it at Half Price Books, I think, just randomly. Uh, I was just looking at the games for this console, and I just happened to glance aside, and they had movies that this console can play as well sitting there and i was just kind of like oh that okay it was like five bucks and that is tron on uhd for the psp i did have a good number of movies on uhd or sorry yeah umd sorry not uhd umd i can't even remember what that stands for though yeah I don't remember. I did have a number of UMD films back in the day when I had my original PSP back in the was it the mid to late two thousands. Uh, I had Serenity. I had this. I had Escape from New York. Um, I had at least one horror movie. It might have been the Dawn of the Dead remake. I had like maybe ten movies on DVD or on sorry UMD that I would watch when I would go and do laundry and stuff like that. So. Really, I realized that I was never going to actually sit down and watch them on UMD outside of like if I was doing laundry or something like that, or maybe on a trip. Uh, so once I got rid of my my PSP back in the day, uh, I got rid of every, all the games, all the movies, and everything. And when I got back into collecting, I was just kind of like, I'm just going to leave the UMDs out of it. I'm just going for the games because I have no reason to watch these except for picking up a copy of Tron. It does have a good number of extras on it, too. You can kind of see them right there, but it even has the chapter select page inside, the little slip, and instructions on how to use a UMD, which is kind of awesome. But you can see the game, the movie right there. I keep wanting to call it a game. It's not a game. It's a movie. <laughs> but had to pick that one up. And now we can get into the DVDs. So I have some weird stuff in here. Some stuff that is personal to me, like stuff that I did, stuff that I've made. Starting off with one of the training videos that I made for my my previous employer to the one I am at right now. Uh, and this, uh, when I made this in the late 2000s, I want to say like 2007, I did this and it ended up going Company-wide, they used this as a training video for every facility in the company. And it's a big company. And that is this video I did called 5 Steps to, or 5S, 5 Steps to Success. And you can see the company that I used to work for up here. It went all throughout that company. And uh, this was made because the, the guy that was in charge of the facility at the time was really into this organizational process called 5S, which he stole from Japan. This is something that's used all throughout Japan, especially in Toyota, which we heard about ad nauseum all the time. And it's organizational steps, five S's, and each step starts with an S. It was like sort. Oh, Jesus, I can't even remember what they were. It's been so long since I did this. It's sort, oh, Jesus, something, 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 sustain. I can't remember all of the, the names of the, it's been a while. I don't even watch this thing anymore. Um, 
it took about eight months, I want to say, to make this. It took like a month and a half for us to shoot it, another month and a half for us to narrate it. I had to get a specific person from within the, the organization to show up after work to record dialogue for maybe a couple of hours. And it took forever to get this thing recorded. And then like another six to seven months to, or six months probably to edit it together. And we had like a premiere and it went through the roof. We ended up having like multiple screenings of it in the, in the building and then we made multiple copies. We like sent a master copy out to get duplicated and it got sent out to every single facility within the company. So yeah, this is like probably the biggest thing I've done. You can see some of the people who are involved at the, in the process on the back. It was not fun to make because there was a lot of uh, stipulations. We weren't allowed to do certain things. We couldn't film certain things. Uh, and, uh, the budget was not high, although I did manage to convince, uh, the guy that ran the facility to buy me a Mac, like a, a, a really expensive Mac that was built for editing with two monitors. And he ended up also buying a really expensive DV camera. That was like one of the top of the line DV cameras for like home use. Uh, and part of my deal with them was to... Like, once I make this video for you guys, because I'm doing it on my own time, like, I'm doing it after work. I'm not doing it on work hours. I'm filming after work. I'm editing after work, doing the narration after work. Sometimes if there was nothing going on in my department, I would go and do some work on the on the uh, movie. But uh, part of my stipulation was once we're done with the movie, those things come home with me, and I can use them for my own personal film projects, which I did quite a bit. I made my own – I made tons of stuff with that, uh, the computer and – until uh, I was let go. So, like I said, probably the biggest thing I ever did. And then we're going to move on to this big television box set. So I'm mixing all the television stuff in with the regular movies because I have so few DVDs in my collection that I just said, what the hell, just keep everything together. Don't separate everything like I do with the Blu-rays and the 4Ks. And this is the Complete Angel box set angel the television show the spinoff from buffy the vampire slayer uh this is seasons one through five how many discs is in here 30 discs 30 dvds in here and you open it up like so and you have these like this is an entire season's worth of dvds of angel Angel's probably my favorite. I like Angel over Buffy the Vampire Slayer by quite a lot. Uh, I talked about this, I think, last time as well. Here's a book, the Complete DVD Collection book, that has essays and chapter stops for every episode and synopsises of each season and some episodes and stuff like that. Uh, like the highlight episodes. Uh, like I was saying, I prefer this over Buffy because it is the more adult show compared to Buffy. Buffy's about teenagers on their way into adulthood. Angel's about people who are already adults <laughs> who are like, well, Angel's of a, a vampire has been around for like 300 some years. Um, and all the people that he associates with are adults and he has adult problems. So I find this one more relatable and I do prefer the characters as well because, you know, even though Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a great show, it really is. Buffy is kind of an asshole. <laughs> Angel can be as well, but I prefer this over Buffy hands down. I will if I was given the choice, you want to watch Buffy or, or an episode of Buffy or an episode of Angel, I will pick an episode of Angel every time. Uh, there's a bunch of really great episodes in here. Some of them, there's a couple of seasons. Well, there's no one season in particular that I'm not very fond of, and that is the fourth season, where they brought in uh, Jasmine. Uh, who is like this fallen god who is like uh, hip, not hypnotizing, but uh, brainwashing everybody to loving into loving her. And in reality, and she looks like this beautiful woman to everyone else, but there's certain people that can see what she really looks like. And she looks like a, a rotting corpse covered in maggots and stuff. And the whole thing is she wants to have a baby that's going to take over the world. And she kind of gets Angel's child to turn on him, to try to kill him, to get him out of the way. 
And it's just, it, I don't like the idea of Angel's kid. I think the actor that plays him is terrible. He was on Mad Men. Was it Vincent Carthizer? I thought he was terrible in the show. I think he's a terrible actor, period. Um, and he's just gross looking. <laughs> um, I just did not care for that season at all. They kind of kicked uh, Cordelia, who was a character that came over from Buffy uh, for this show. Like that was one of the one of the reasons why I don't like Joss Whedon anymore. Is like the truth came out about why Cordelia left the show, and it was basically because she went to Joss Whedon and says, "Okay, I'm pregnant." Can we, are we gonna do you want to work this into the show? And he was like, Are you gonna keep it? And then he basically punished her every day she was on set because she was ruining his vision of how the show should go because she decided to have a life outside of the job and you know have a child, which is pretty shitty. And she says that she didn't want to work in Hollywood anymore after that because it like scarred her, like she got like PTSD or something from it. And they kind of just kick her off the show on ceremony, so they just kind of kill her for no reason. And it's, it really sucks, and that season kind of pisses me off for those reasons. But it bounces back in the fifth season because they decided to full, or bring Spike into the show from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He was one of the most popular characters from Buffy, even though Joss Whedon hated that character. He, decided, he designed Spike to be killed off on the Buffy show, but he became so popular he had no choice but to keep him on against Joss Whedon's better judgment. And I guess he always hated that, too. So... Boo on you, Joss Whedon. And then we're going to move on to the original show. And that is all seven seasons of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Back in the day, they had originally released the Buffy the Vampire Slayer seasons in these thick-ass cardboard uh, like special editions that like unfolded. Kind of like the way... No, that doesn't do it like that, but... They were they were like really tall. They were really wide. You had to open them up, and there's like slips in there that the the discs would slip into, which I hate. I prefer like the little things where, you know, the discs click in and something to hold it in place. Not this little cardboard slip where you pop it in. It just it ruins the discs. DVDs are not as indestructible as like Blu-rays and 4Ks are because they have that scratch resistant plastic on them. DVDs are a little more susceptible to that kind of thing. Uh, so I was not happy. They took up a lot of shelf space. And when I first started getting into Blu-ray collecting back when they were first uh, released, back in like 2006 or whatever it was, um, I got rid of all the stuff that was bulky and took up too much space. So those television shows all went. And then eventually they released them in these like slim versions, which are basically the exact same size as a standard DVD case. So all seven seasons of Buffy I picked up. These belonged to my father. So did the Angel set. Uh, when my father passed, my mother... Uh, doesn't watch a lot of stuff like this. So she basically told me and my brother, if there's anything in like your father's video or not video game collection, uh, like physical media collection when it comes to movies like DVDs and Blu-rays or whatever that you want, just take it. So I ended up snagging Buffy and this and uh, also Babylon 5, uh, the Babylon 5 series. I took all five of those and Crusade and the movies. And then when they released the DV or the Blu-ray set, I sold everything. Um, but yeah, season one of Buffy, it's like half of a season. It was a mid season replacement and it's a, I'm not a fan of the actual Buffy, the vampire slayer movie that came out in the nineties. The one that, uh, has Chris or Christy Swanson or Christy Swanson playing Buffy. I'm not a fan of it. I think it's like just dumb. Uh, so when this was first announced, I had zero interest in watching it and my father, was like obsessed with shows starring teenagers. I don't know why he always, he watched this ever would uh, I'm trying to think uh, Gilmore girls. Uh, it was like anything that was on the WB and Fox that involved like teenagers, he would watch. And this was included. So I remember every once in a while I would catch part of an episode because I was still living at home at that point, And I'd be like, I'd look at the TV and I'd be like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Still Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And eventually I sat down one day while we were eating dinner and I watched an episode. And I was like, you know what? This isn't half bad. I really like that it's serious and has like jokey moments. But for the most part, it's like really well written. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. So I watched a couple more episodes when they were being broadcast. And I was like, yeah, this is actually kind of cool. I'll go and pick up the first season on, on DVD. And if it sucks, I'll just sell it. Ended up really liking it. And then I burned through every season after that. 
So first season only has like 13, 12 episodes in it. Cause like I said, it was a mid season replacement. But it gets all the main characters developed really well and sets up a really cool cliffhanger for season two. So we got season two here, which I still think is probably one of the best seasons of the show because it had the whole Buffy and Angel romance gone wrong uh, story thread that ended up like taking over the last half of the show because Angel, who is a vampire who has a soul, vampires do not have souls. That's why they are evil. But Angel got cursed. Uh, by a gypsy, I do believe, to put his soul back into his body. So he is a vampire, but now he feels all the guilt of all the things that he had done over the centuries. And he ends up falling in love with Buffy. Buffy falls in love with him. They have a romance. But the thing is, the moment he has a moment of pure happiness, a.k.a. sex, his soul will leave his body and he'll go back to being evil. So it's like he can't enjoy himself. That's what the curse is. And sure enough, they bang, and he turns into one of the best bad guys they've had on this show. And it has like a heartbreaking final episode. But they did bring him back because Angel is super popular in Season 3. This is one of the other great seasons because they brought in Faith, uh, played by Eliza Dushku. You can see right there, who is basically the anti-Buffy. She is an evil vampire slayer, and she goes off the rails. Eliza Dushku is so much fun in here. And I had not seen her in anything since True Lies. She played Schwarzenegger's daughter in True Lies, and I had not seen her in anything until this came out. And I was like, oh, there you are. I remember you in that movie. You're all right in that movie. But she's awesome on this show. And that's what deals with her or Buffy uh, graduating from high school. So in the movie, they made it look like everyone was a senior in high school. But when they created the TV show, they kind of, what do they call it, retconned everything. So Buffy's a sophomore in season one. So she was a freshman in the movie now. Season one is freshman year, season two is junior year, season three is senior year, and then we go into college in season four, which is pretty good. I really like this one. It's where, um, oh, Jesus, uh, I can't remember her goddamn name. <laughs> There's Xander, Willow, she's on the cover there. Willow starts to get a taste for the black magic, and then we have season five where Spike and Anne, uh, Buffy have like a love affair and she gets a sister out of nowhere. Uh, season six is where Willow goes completely off the rails evil for the finale of the series of the show. And it's great. And then we have season seven, which is kind of a meandering season where Buffy gets a job at the high school where the Hellmouth is. That's brings all the evil creatures to town um, as a guidance counselor. And it's okay. And it ends pretty well, I will say, but it's a really good show. But like I said, Buffy is kind of an asshole. And she just constantly does things to put her friends in danger. And it kind of makes her unlikable to me. I know everyone's just kind of like, oh, she's like this feminist icon. Yeah, she is. But you guys, like a lot of people don't understand that she does a lot of things to just, like her, the reason her friends are always getting hurt, it's, it's her fault. She puts them in situations where they shouldn't be there or they shouldn't be involved in something and they always end up getting hurt. They're not her. They don't have the abilities that she has. They're going to die. <laughs> And in season seven, stuff happens to certain people in the group, uh, like with Xander specifically. That really proves my point. Um, next up we have uh, this thing I picked up called Demon Hunters, Dead Camper Lake. This was made by a bunch of students at a Lutheran college. called. Uh, they called themselves the Dead Gentlemen. So I guess they were like an improv theater troupe. And then they started making little short films on campus. And then they decided to make a movie on campus. And they made multiple movies on campus, especially like over their spring breaks or holiday breaks. Uh, they made this series you might have heard of if you're a D&D &D fan called The Gamers. They've made three movies in that series and a like mini, like a, they did a live show of it where they like improv it, uh, which is a gr great movie. The second one is specifically, the second one is awesome. I have that on Blu-ray. Spoiler alert. Um, and then they made these Demon Hunter movies, which is kind of like a rip on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and stuff like that. It's really tongue-in-cheek. Demon Hunter, or Dead Camper Lake is actually the second Demon Hunters movie, but as an extra, the first one is on here as well. And it's they're okay. I wanted to support the guys because I like the gamers so much. Um, they're funny, they're okay, but not my favorite that these guys have done. But if you like cheesy horror stuff like she like evil think army of darkness you'll probably like that if that's like your sense of humor level 
Here's another thing that I did. So back when I had that computer equipment and the camera that I had gotten from my employer for making that training video, uh, I entered a bunch of film races. And what's a film race? Basically, I did two of them. The first one was a 24-hour film race. So at midnight, they if you signed up and paid your due, I think it was like 50 bucks or 75 bucks or something, at midnight of the day that it would start, they would send you an email that had like a line, it would have like a line of dialogue, it would have a theme, um, it would have an item that needed to make an appearance in your little short film. It couldn't be more than seven minutes long in the end. Uh, so the one that, the first one that I participated in, I don't actually think I have on DVD. Uh, the first one I did was a 24 hour one, like the special item that needed to be in there was a hammer. And I think there was a line of dialogue that needed to be in there. Like, it doesn't get much better than that, I think, was the line of dialogue. And in the end, I, after I turned it in, it got shown in an actual theater with all the other videos from all the other contestants, the other people that signed up for it. And it was really cool to see a movie, like a little short film of mine, actually projected in a movie theater on screen. It was fantastic. So it was a good feeling, so I did another one. This one is the, I think it was a 96-hour uh film race yeah from 2008 so at midnight uh you received i think it was another line of dialogue and an action that had to have had to happen within it i don't remember what they were uh but i decided to be ambitious and do like a film noir type of thing film it in black and white film it in 235 2.35 to 1 widescreen aspect ratio and all that and try to do like crazy camera shots and try to do like lighting effects and all this kind of stuff and uh the way this one got uh, judged was everything was put on the website once everything was turned in and the people that like anybody could go to the website and watch all of them and vote on which one was their favorite i did not place uh very high i think it was outside the top 10 but when i would watch the ones that were uh in the top 10 it was the same people that did the ones that won in the 24-hour stream and, or the 24-hour contest, and their stuff felt like it was already pre-made, and they just inserted the things into it that needed to be there to qualify, which is kind of bullshit, because I think that's cheating. And it's like the same people won both times, and it was kind of like, I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing these anymore because they're unfair. Um, so the one that I did for the 96-hour one is called Dead Man's Party. And like I said, it's a film noir about a serial killer who is stalking a swingers party and he ends up finding a woman that's there who's there to do the exact same thing. And they kind of end up falling in love with each other while they're there. And I had a lot of fun making this one. I tried, I, I watched a bunch of, like, since I had 96 hours to do it, I ended up, like, before I wrote anything, I decided to watch a whole bunch of noir films, like uh, Double Indemnity and stuff like that, to get, like, a feel for what I needed to have in there to make it feel like a, an old-school noir movie. Like, camera shots, stuff like that what would, what would be appropriate. And uh, I did a bunch of research on the lingo that would work or that would be appropriate for that time period for like the 1940s. And a couple of lines were kind of clunky. One of the, the the main actress, Kelly, here was like, that one line of yours is stupid. I was like, well, I still want you to say it. <laughs> um, but we had a great time making it. I got a caterer to uh, get us make us the food for everything. We rented out the banquet hall for the apartment complex I was in to film it. It was a lot of fun. And it took a while to edit it. I ended up having like a gaff with the lead actor. So the lead actor who was in the 24 hour film race that I did, I had planned, I had to talk to him about playing the lead in this one as well. He just never showed up. So one of the guys that showed up to be my sound guy, who was also dabbled in acting like in high school and college, I ended up asking him to just take over the part real quick. And even though I feel like he's a little miscast in this, I think he did a good job for, you know, like not having any prep done. Or anything so I think it turned out pretty well um, I have two different cuts on here you can see down here I have the Grand Prix cut which is the cut that I had to turn in it couldn't be longer than five minutes and 30 seconds then I have my director's cut which has a totally different ending I had to make up an ending because it was running too long out of the footage I had so I cobbled together a new ending and a lot of people seem to like that one more than the, the uh, cut that I made for myself and then we also have a blooper reel 
Uh, next up, I have a documentary that I picked up at, I think this was at Dragon Con when I went to uh, Georgia. What is it? Uh, Atlanta in 2007. And it's called Done the Impossible, The Fan's Tale of Firefly and Serenity. Uh, it's not that long. This is like 80, 79 minutes long. Uh, it's all about Firefly and its effect on the fans and why people like it so much. That kind of thing. It has interviews with some of the stars and Joss Whedon and stuff like that. This was ma- this was I found this like at the height of my Firefly fandom. Like the movie had come up, come out already in two thousand and five, and I was over the moon about that. I loved the show, hated it when I first saw it on TV because they were airing it out of order and it made no sense. Uh, but ended up like watching it on DVD and absolutely loving it. Love the movie. I saw the movie like four or five times in the theater, and I was still super hyped because at this particular Dragon Con that I went to, where I picked this up. A bunch of the stars of Firefly were there, like Ron Glass and uh, a guy who played Badger. I can't remember what his name is. He was there. I think he's an Irish actor. I can't remember what his name is, though. Um, and a couple of others. And it was awesome. Like, like I said, it was at the height of my fandom, so I picked that up. It's okay. I wouldn't recommend it. But then I had to get this because of the current thing I'm doing. We're doing it this weekend as well. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I kind of got back into Dungeons and Dragons. Used to play Dungeons and Dragons back in the late 2000s, and the people that I went to Dragon Con with were from that D and D group. Um, I used to watch this Saturday morning cartoon all the time when I was a kid, and that is the Dungeons and Dragons animated series. Um, when I got back into playing D and D, this is the first thing I looked for to kind of like get me excited about being a DM again. Uh, and I watched all the episodes of this, and they are absolutely fantastic. Like, J. Michael Straczynski, who created Babylon 5, wrote episodes of this. It is nuts. And while they, on the surface, look very childish and cheaply made, they are very well written and fun, and sometimes really, really funny. This has all 27 episodes from the three seasons, and, like, the third season is only, like, five episodes, and there's one that never was produced, so I think it was supposed to have six episodes. But, like, everything you like from Dungeons & Dragons is in here at some point. And it's a lot of fun. I like all the characters. Um, I think Venger is actually a pretty cool bad guy. You can see him right here. And Tiamat, the uh, the ongoing threat, the Hydra dragon, is a pretty cool uh, villain as well. So I had to pick this one up. This is the one that when I... There are multiple versions of this out there. Some of them only have the one season on it. Some of them are just a handful of, like, of selected episodes in a compilation. This is every episode that's available. That's the one I wanted to get. It was a little expensive, but I was willing to pay for it. D&D rocks. Yep. What's up, Canadian Retro? How's it going? Haven't seen you since MGC. Are you going to MGC this year again? Um, but yeah, now that I'm running a D&D campaign and I stream it on Twitch, if you're interested, let me know and I'll give you the address. Uh, we're going to stream this Saturday night. Uh, so pick this one up. Day one. And it went out of print soon after, and it is very expensive now because it is super rare. And that is Dust Devil. And this is the limited collector's edition. I picked this up at Best Buy, and then I never saw it again after the day that I bought it. Anywhere. Has four discs. So this is a movie by... uh, What's his goddamn name? Richard Stanley. Guy who directed Hardware, which is the movie that made me want to be a filmmaker. Uh, This is the movie that he made after Hardware. And he ended up, he was working for Miramax. This was under, I think, under Dimension Films. or Was it just straight up Miramax? Or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, no problem, dude. I'll put it, in the, uh, put it in the chat real quick. Hang on, everybody. There you go. That's the link to my Twitch chan- channel. We're going to start streaming around 6.30 p.m. Central on Saturday. Hope to see you there. Okay, so when Richard Stanley made this movie, he was working under uh, Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, always known as uh, Harvey Scissorhands, just can't keep his grubby hands off of the films that go through his company. He, Unless it's a movie by Quentin Tarantino or Kevin Smith, he feels he has to, like, cut the movie up to, to ribbons, basically. He does it all the time. 
And it's kind of one of the reasons why people don't like working or didn't like working with them because they had the reputation of like butchering people's movies. Yeah, he would give you a break, but he would also be like, nope, this movie's not going to make money. I'm going to recut it my way so that it does make money. And usually it worked, but the movie was in a, like was terrible. Like, look at The Crow 2. Um, look at this. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Uh, Mimic. He did it to Guillermo del Toro with Mimic. Uh, he does it, Cinema Paradiso, the movie that put them on the map. It was an Italian movie that he basically edited 45 minutes out of the movie just so it wouldn't run long and it can get more screenings in. Uh, so Dust Devil is like a supernatural thriller about this serial killer who run, who is like trekking through South Africa, uh, murdering people in these like ritualistic thing, uh, like murder, th I can't know how to describe it. It's like these murders that have to be like ritualistic because he's worship he worships like this dust devil. He turns out he is the dust devil. Um, and there's three different cuts of the movie on here. There's his work print, original work print cut. There is a director's cut. There's the work print cut, and it has like it has like scenes on it that were only available on VHS that he had to cut into the movie. Then there's like the cut that he turned into the Weinsteins, which I think is like the director's cut. And then there's the theatrical cut. And the theatrical cut is not good because it doesn't make any sense. And on top of that, it also has a bunch of the short films that Richard Stanley made that got him noticed to the point where someone said, hey, I'm going to give you money to make a movie. And that movie ended up being Hardware, which is, like I said, one of my favorite movies of all time. So this has Secret Glory, Voice of the Moon. And I cannot read what the last one is. The White something. or The White Ghost or something. Uh, but whatever. The work print cut is the better cut of the film, I will say. It is still kind of a nonsensical movie, but it's interesting, and it has like really great camera work and cinematography. Uh, it stars Richard John Burke, who ended up playing Robocop in Robocop 3, and Chelsea Field, who played Tila in the Masters of the Universe live-action movie. She was also in The Last Boy Scout. And she has a really bad South African accent that she can't seem to get a grasp of because in some scenes it's there and some scenes it's not where she's just like oh yeah i forgot i'm supposed to be playing someone from south africa <laughs> and zake smokai who is also in uh, serpent in the rainbow he plays a police detective in south africa it's it's cool it could have been a lot better but uh i'm glad that i have this because this is not available anywhere else next up is one of the films my brother made i actually helped him finance this i gave him 2500 dollars to help make this and that is farewell darkness uh, it's a drama that my brother made in Chicago. We actually filmed it at my previous employer a little a little bit. Ended up all that stuff ended up getting cut. And this is actually just a burned version that he gave me. But what's up, game room? How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Um, I'm not a big fan of this one, even though I helped I helped get it made. And I was like, I did some makeup on the movie. I did some like graphic gore effects. Um, I was a location manager because when we filmed at my previous employer. I was the person that was making sure that they weren't breaking stuff. And like I said, I'm also like an, an executive producer because I gave them money for it. Uh, but we saw this in the movie theater. They did show the premiere at a movie theater, and I was not a big fan. I think it's a little bit boring, and I don't like the lead in the movie. I think he does a terrible job. But And my brother kind of got screwed on the distribution of it. Good to hear, dude. Next up is another television box set, and that is the Friday the 13th of the series, all three seasons. Uh, and I don't know how many episodes are here, but this is like this weird box set thing that is still used today, especially for Blu-ray box sets for TV shows. <laughs> Not a fan at all because it's clunky and it's too big, but I absolutely loved this show when it was on. Uh, so here it was on a UHF station. Not one of the one of not one of the major three. Here was on uh, WPWR, I think it was called. It was channel fifty, and it was on at like ten thirty at night on a Sunday, yeah, regularly. So uh, when I finally got a television in my bedroom, I got it for like my birthday one year. I think when I was in like seventh or eighth grade, I would make sure to stay up on Sunday night and get my little rabbit ear antenna tuned in so I could watch Friday the 13th in my room, and I absolutely loved it. But it has absolutely... If you've never seen this before... Yeah, I didn't really have a choice doing the jobs because, like, they, we were filming at my place of work, so I was the person responsible for the entire crew being there to make sure they weren't busting the place up. So I got I was considered a location manager in the credits. 
I did, they didn't have an effect person one day, and they needed someone to like work a whole bunch of squibs and effects. So I ended up doing that that day, and you know, I got credit for that. I like I said, I gave them twenty five hundred dollars to help make the movie, so I was an associate producer. So yeah. Um, this show has absolutely nothing to do with Friday the 13th or the Friday the 13th films. It has nothing to do with Jason Voorhees. The whole idea behind this show is this dude who owned a, an antique store that was about to go bankrupt and makes a deal with the devil and his, in exchange for his soul, uh, he gets like the store won't go out of business and he can leave money and, uh, the store for like his descendants, you know, when time comes. But the devil kind of screws him over, and and also with with taking his soul, he also curses every single item that is in the antique store, and each one will do something specific to the person who buys it. So the first episode's about a doll that Sarah Polly, you know, who won an Oscar last year, was it last year or the year before? Uh, she's this little girl who gets this doll from the antique shop, and the doll comes alive and starts killing people. It's stuff like that. They're like it's like the monkey paw kind of thing with a lot of the items. One of them is um, a pair of surgical of a no a pair of white leather gloves that um, a guy who is a faith healer buys from the store. He finds out that if he touches somebody who's diseased, the disease will get sucked into the, the gloves. But he can't take the gloves off from that point on because if he does, he will get the disease if he takes the gloves off. So he has to like put up with the pain of the disease like being in his hands until he transfers it to somebody else. And he usually goes and finds like a homeless person and puts his hands on him and he transfers the disease to them. But when he transfers it, the disease is 100% worse. Uh, and it ends up like like killing the person instantly kind of thing. And it's, it's that kind of thing. And the whole idea is once the dude who owns the shop, once he dies and his soul gets taken by the devil, he leaves the store to his, to his niece and his nephew and a friend of the dude who owned the store comes to help them reclaim all the items and like lock them in a vault so they can't hurt anyone else. It's really cool because each episode deals with a different item from the store. And I thought that was really clever and fun, and it works for a television show. And there's some great like people who worked on like David Cronenberg, the guy who directed the Fly remake, and Scanners directed an episode specifically that one with the gloves that I, the gloves that I was talking about. Uh, Adam Agoyan, who ended up becoming like an auteur director. Uh, in Canada, directed uh, an episode of this. It's and there's a lot of stars who were like nobodies at the time. Like I said, Sarah Polly ends up, you know, being in episodes. There's lots of Canadian actors that you know now that were nobodies back then, and it's really a fun show. It kind of goes off the rails in the third season because you have the three leads: the male, the younger male lead, uh, John D. Lee May, decided to quit because he thought that he was too good for the show and he wanted to start making movies. And what was the movie that he made? Jason goes to hell and it ruined his career <laughs> and they replaced him with like Roby, who's the female leech. They replaced it with her boyfriend in the show at the time. And he sucks. He's terrible, but it's a great show. I had no idea that the entire thing was available on DVD. I found this at Walmart and I was super thrilled that I did Sarah Polly pocket. <laughs> What's up, Peter? Homeless people don't deserve disease. Oh, it's a horror show. But it is, I will say this, for a television show that was on, like, a UHF station, it was graphically violent. It was head and shoulders above anything else that I saw on television at the time. It was really pushing the limits. And I'm surprised it got away with most of it. But I think because it was being, like, broadcast, like, later at night, they got away with a little bit more than they normally would. Same with the Freddy's Nightmares TV show, which definitely needs to get, like, a DVD release. It is great. It's a great show. It has nothing to do with the movies, but it's great in its own right. Next up, I was talking about that Dead Camper Lake um, Demon Hunters movie. Well, these are the ones that got them noticed, and that is The Gamers. So this is about playing D&D. So this is honestly just... So the whole Gamers thing deals with a bunch of people playing D&D, and as they are playing it in our reality, we see the game being played with those same actors playing their in-game counterparts going through the adventure. This one is like a, like I want to say like a practice run for what ended up becoming the second movie, which is called Dorkness Rising. Um, and it's not long. I think this is only like 40 minutes long. And it, like I said, it's like a practice run where you see that there's the DM, there's the players. They don't really have personalities. It's, it's basically like you hear the DM saying, this is what's going on. You might hear a player say, well, I want to do this. And you'll actually see that same actor in character as their, their player character doing that thing. 
it's okay. It's not great. But like I said, for a starting point that ended up going into creating something better, it's worth it. UHF station, UHF, not Weird Al Yankovic's UHF. <laughs> and like I have, I have Dorkness Rising on Blu-ray. I'll talk about that when I get there. But I also said that they did like a live improv version. And I found this also at, what was this, at Gen, no, Gen Con. Oh, yeah, Gen Con. I found this at Gen Con in like 2013 or 2014. At uh, There was, the Dead Gentleman guys were in cahoots with the people that make Pathfinder, the the tabletop RPG Pathfinder. I don't know, the Paizo, I think is the name of the company. They were like in with those guys for a little while because they were promoting their products. And this I found at the Paizo booth at Gen Con. And I was like, oh, shit, I like the gamers. I'll check this out. So I guess they did this at Gen Con in 2012, and I had no idea that it was happening. I think I would have had to pay separately for it anyway. But, yeah, basically what they ended up doing was they went, they like, all the actors from the movie were there, and they basically took ideas from the crowd, like, as, like a, at an improv show, and, like, well, give me a character type and what their deal is. And then they improvised an entire campaign on stage in front of everybody, and that just sounded really awesome and fun. So I ended up picking this up. It's all, it is pretty rad. But Dork, it does not beat Darkness Rising. Darkness Rising is still the best one. This I had back in the day, and it's because of the genre, the genre of music that I that I'm really into. And I ended up selling it, and it turned out to be really expensive after that. Like it ended up becoming like hard to find. Excuse me. Luckily, I found somebody slipping on Amazon store the the marketplace to get a new copy of it. That is in Gothic Industrial Madness. It's basically 40 music videos of gothic industrial music. You can see them all listed here. And I'm a huge fan of industrial music. That's like my chosen genre. Still to this day. Got into it in the mid-90s and I've never looked back. And it has, uh, let me see if there's any bands here that might. Uh, Einstein, Newbottom, uh, Pigface, Electric Hellfire Club, D. Krups. Uh, Frontline Assembly, who was one of my favorite bands, or one of the first industrial bands that I really got into. Um, buh, 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 buh. Raised in Black, D uh, Killing Joke, Birmingham Six, Christian Death, Mephisto, Mephisto Waltz, Leather Strip. Um, this. I always like I brought this over to my one of my friends' houses when I first got it, and we watched everything. And I remember watching it and saying to my buddy, I was like, "This has everything you could ever want. It shows you what to do in a music video, like the thing to do for certain songs to make it interesting, and exactly what not to do in music videos to make it interesting. Like there's some that are like just, I have a camcorder. Let's just place it at the band, you know, aim it at the band, and record the whole thing in one shot, kind of sh bullshit. And it's like, no, that's not how you make a music video. And then there's other ones. Like the one by D. Krupps that's called uh, To the Hilt, which I think is one of the most creative music videos because it's simple. It looks like it's done in one take. It's not. Uh, but it does interesting things with the visuals that I think is pretty rad. And I'm like, that's how you make a music video and keep it interesting. And then there's other ones where it's just, like I said, a camera pointed at, a, at the band while they're playing in the basement kind of thing. But it's really fun. I like It's like a time capsule of the 90s industrial scene, so... If you like industrial music, I'd say check it out. Prep and limes start jamming in the streets. No, it's not like that. <laughs> industrial is like Nine Inch Nails. And uh, like I said, Frontline Assembly, KMFDM, my favorite band of all time, KMFDM, that kind of stuff. Um, have I they're, The first movie in this series is finally getting is getting a UHD, or sorry, a UHD, uh, U... Yeah, UHD, a 4K release. Stop saying UHD, 4K. The first film in this series is getting a U... I almost did it again. A 4K release, and it's getting like the director's cut that we've never seen over here in the States. I prefer the second movie, and it has not come out anywhere except on DVD, so I'm not getting rid of this until it comes out. And it's based on an anime that I love, and that's The Giver 2. If you've never seen this movie, and you like superhero movies and sci-fi movies, definitely go and check this out. It is freaking fantastic. So, the first movie came out. It lied to everybody. It's like Mark Hamill as the Giver. He's not playing the Giver. He's playing a freaking detective. The Giver is like some teenage kid in the movie. And the Giver is basically like Blue Beetle. 
uh, it's a set of alien armor that came down and latches onto a person, and whenever he needs to do some fighting, it pops out and covers him and makes him a super awesome kung fu fighter that can not be killed. And he has like a nuclear reactor in his in his man packs. <laughs> There's blades that come out of like his his elbows, and he's like a martial arts master. And it's it's a really cool anime. I love the anime. The first movie was made PG-13, and it just feels real sterile and kind of cheap. This one came out of nowhere. I had no clue that this got made. I went to the local Blockbuster one day, and this was sitting on the shelf, and I was like, what? Where did that come from? Did the first one Was the first one that popular that it got a sequel? Well, apparently this had half the budget, and, but it's twice as long. This one is over two hours long, and it stars uh, the dude who is the voice of Solid Snake in the Metal Gear Solid games, uh, David Hayter. He is the lead in the movie. He is the Giver. And there's no and Chris Christopherson's daughter is in this. And I think she's they're the only two people that you might recognize. Um, and this one is rated R, and it is a hard R. The fight scenes in this are absolutely insane. The guy who directed this movie directed a whole bunch of episodes of the Power Rangers TV show. And it shows because the stupid stuff that people were doing in the Power Rangers show, all the stupid hand movements that make no sense. Uh, it's in there, but then all of a sudden gets someone gets their neck broken and blood just shoots out of their mouth. Or someone gets their head stepped on and it explodes all over the camera. It is graphic as all hell, but it is super, super cool and fun. I absolutely love it. I will not get rid of this until we get a 4K version. Uh, I highly recommend it, too. If you like a good old-fashioned martial arts movie, this is awesome. And the coolest part is there's a fight scene that happens in the middle of the movie between... The Giver and a bunch of the Zoonoids, who are like the, the villains of the show, of the anime, that recreates scenes from the opening title sequence of the anime. And it is super cool to see it happen in live action. I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. Went to 90 It was so much fun, yeah. Hey, Peter, did I make you a mod? Yeah, I did. You want, want, want to do something here? <laughs> uh, next up, we have the Halo 3 Essentials. This came with my special edition or limited edition or whatever it is, collector's edition of Halo 3 that I bought back when the game was first released. It came with the giant Master Chief helmet. The Chief helmet comes off of its base, and inside was uh, this DVD and... What was it? A bunch of like cards and stuff like that, and the game. Um, I've never actually popped this into my DVD player. It has Essentials Disc One and Two. I'm assuming it's just documentary stuff about the making of the game and all that. But like I said, I've never actually popped this in. It comes with a book. It comes with two books actually. Yeah, one is a comic book. And the other one is stuff about the game. It's like <laughs> how your controller works. And also like a poster that has the Arbiter and Master Chief. Uh, yeah, like I said, I've never actually popped this into my DVD player to see what it is. But I keep it on my DVD shelf because why not? Also because I use the helmet, the little storage space inside for storage. This one I hear will not work anymore. I hear that they used really cheap DVDs to make this. I mean, it looks fine. It does not look like it's damaged in any way. It doesn't look like it has any kind of disc rot or anything like that. But I hear from lots of sources that these things were made so cheap and then the discs ended up just deteriorating. You can't watch it anymore. Getting some obscure movie knowledge. Have yet to see a movie in that pile since I started watching. <laughs> uh, and that is The Hire. This was a series of short films that were made to advertise whatever the new model of BMW was the year that these came out, like in 2006 or something like that, 2005, 2006. And it, they all star Clive Owen, who was like a nobody at the time. But this kind of got him some attention, and he ended up starting to show up in like real big movies after this. And each one of these episodes, there's eight episodes on here, or eight little short films. Each one is directed by, like, a major film director. One of them is, well, let me see here, Joe Carnahan did the A-Team, um, the, the movie The A-Team, and Smoke and Aces. One is by Tony Scott, the guy who directed Top Gun and uh, Crimson Tide. 
What is that? John Woo did one. You know, John Woo, hard target, hard boiled. One is John Frankenheimer, the guy who directed the French Connection. Uh, one is Ang Lee, the guy who directed the Hulk, eh, but also Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. One is Wong Kar Wai. He did a bunch of Korean films. I don't remember the name of any of them, but I've seen a couple. Uh, one is Guy Ritchie, the guy who did Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. And one is Alejandro Gonzalez in Aritu, and I think he did that movie with Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett. They both won Oscars for it. I don't remember the name of it. But I loved every one of these. Each one has a different tone. Some are cheesy, some are silly, some are dead serious, some are violent as all hell. I'm surprised that a lot of these were used to advertise a freaking car. But, like, BMW was trying to do some really cool advertising things, and I'm really glad that they released them physically because they were only available on the BMW website at the time. And then I just happened to log on one day because I'm like, I haven't watched some of those in a while. I want to check them out again. And it said DVD now available. And I was like, yep, click, buy. So super happy that I have it. I should probably check this out tonight to see if it actually still works. Here is a short film that my brother made, uh, and it got him some awards, and it is called I Want Him Dead. It's like a... Uh, like a romantic comedy where uh, this actor played by my brother's friend, Dave Bianchi breaks up with his girlfriend and she can't hack it. Uh, so everywhere she goes, she sees his face on billboards and all that. So she plans this elaborate way to kill him to get back at him for breaking up. And it's really, really funny and well-made. This is probably my favorite thing my brother has done film wise. So I had to get a copy of that. Plus he's my brother. And then talking about KMFDM being my favorite industrial band, I have a whole bunch of KMFDM concert uh, DVDs, and I keep on moving the wrong thing out. <laughs> uh, so I have this first one, which is called Beat by Beat by Beat, and this one is the original video anthology plus bonus material. It has the Dollars Tour in Chicago, bootleg videos, live in Dallas, more music videos. So I think this is the one, yeah, this is the one that actually has all of their music videos on it. There's one for Son of a Gun, uh, there's the one for Juke Joint Jezebel, there's the one for What Do You Know Deutschland, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Godlike. So I love their music videos because they're all animated. At least the older ones, ones, the ones from the 80s and 90s were animated, really interestingly too. So I wanted to pick this one up specifically because it has all the music videos on it. This is before YouTube. The only way I was going to be able to get these was through here. You know, I couldn't go to YouTube and look them up. Uh, and it also has some concerts. The only thing is, since the rest of these are just concert videos, one is the World War III tour from 2003, and this is the Sturm and Drang tour from 2002. They are filmed with, like, handy cams, and the audio is not great, so I can't really say that they're worth having, but if you're a KMFDM fan like me, definitely worth it, but... Audio quality isn't great. The video quality isn't great. That's awesome. Yeah, my brother lived in L.A. for like 12, 13 years. Um, and he worked on a bunch of movies. Uh, he's a director by trade, but now he's basically just an editor. And he makes movies on... He like directs stuff on the side when he can. But he worked on... I'm trying to think of the name of the movies that he was working on. He worked on Cabin Fever... Zero. Sean Astin's in it. He worked with Sean Astin for a little while. I said he was a complete dick. Um, <laughs> uh, the sequel to A Haunting in Connecticut. I think it's like Ghost of Mississippi or something like that. A um, couple other movies. Uh, there was the one with uh, Elizabeth Olsen and uh, the girl from Parks and Recreation, Aubrey Plaza, the two of them. I can't remember the name of it. Something goes, Ingrid Goes West, he worked on that. Uh, next up, we have another television show, and that is Lex. This is the first and second seasons of Lex. So Lex is a joint Canadian and German TV series that I remember it was, initially it started as four movies for Showtime. The first season of this are the four movies that were made for Showtime. Each one is about an hour and a half long. And they basically take what you think a Star Trek type show or a Stargate type show or a Babylon 5 type show would be and completely flips it on its ear. It is overly sexualized. It's weird. It's stupid. <laughs> but I think they're so off the wall strange that they're really creative. Like Farscape was kind of a thing at the time. 
So the living ship idea from Farscape here, the ship that everybody is on, the Lex, is a living ship as well. It's like a giant insect. And every once in a while, it needs to crash land on a planet and just start eating everything in order to refuel. And I'm talking eating everything. We're talking people, buildings, anything that it can get its hands on. And it's kind of funny when they do it. They, they kind of use it for laughs. And uh, the movies are strange. Some of them are good. Some of them I don't like. There's a couple that just feel like a waste of time. Like the one with uh, Rucker Hauer is pretty bad. But the one with Tim Curry is pretty fun. Um, the one with Malcolm McDowell is kind of strange too. And then it has the whole second season, which is actually a season. Like, you know, an actual television show continuation. And that has like, I want to say like 20 episodes or something like that. Season two has one, two, has 20 episodes. Yep. You can see them all listed here. So the first season is four movies and then 20 episodes of the show. They actually lasted for four seasons. I need to find some collection that has season three and four on it. Um, like I said, I like the show is not good. I will say that it is not good. <laughs> but it's so different and strange and weird that I can't help but like it for trying to do something different when everyone else was trying to copy Star Trek and Stargate and all that kind of thing. So I like it for trying to be its own thing. I tried getting multiple friends of mine hooked like into that show, and every time they bring it back, and they're like, you can keep it. No thank you. Another TV show, we got Mortal Kombat Conquest. Of course I had to have this. I'm a Mortal Kombat fan. I mean, duh. <laughs> um, this came out after the second movie, Annihilation, which I will talk about multiple times in these streams. It's a complete piece of shit. This is definitely better than... The second film, but definitely not better than the first. Um, it follows Kung Lao. It takes place in the far past, like when the first Mortal Kombat tournament came to the the uh, you know to Earth Realm, and it follows around Kung Lao, uh, and he has two friends that hang out with him. One of them is a thief. One of them is another fighter. They are not characters that are in any of the video games, but all the characters from the games make appearances at some point. You got Sub Zero, Scorpion, Raiden is a main character. Uh, and Shao Kahn is the main character. They're both played by the same guy since they're supposed to be brothers because of the shit that happened in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. <laughs> um, what, who else is in here? Smoke shows up. Rain shows up. Reptile shows up. Um, I'm trying to think. There's also a bunch of characters that they made. Shang Tsung is a major character in it. Um, they also made up a bunch of characters like Kriya, who is like this princess in Nadenia. Um... And there's a sorceress girl who shows up once in a while, too. I can't remember what her name is. It's been a while. But the show is actually pretty cool. The fight scenes are pretty well made. There's a fight scene at the end of the pilot episode that has some of the coolest wire work I've seen. Like it's better than it is in the movies. The only thing is they try to copy what was done in the movies by having like techno music playing over every fight, even though this takes place like in the, like oh god, like a thousand years ago or something like that. There's like techno music playing over the fight scenes. It's really strange, but I really do like it. Uh, Christiana Loken, who played the Terminator in Terminator 3, this is where she got her start. This is the first thing she ever did. And it's actually pretty cool. Daniel Bernhardt is in here as well. He was uh, in. He was one of the agents in The Matrix Reloaded. But I really like this show. I was watching it and the Crow TV show when they were being broadcast on another UHF. No, was it TNT? I think TNT used to play it. And I really got a kick out of it. It was totally strange for sure. Yeah, Lex is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, but I, I love it. Uh, this I this I wish was on at least Blu-ray, but it never has come out that way. But it is The Philadelphia Experiment. It's a movie that came out in, I think, 84. It was written by John Carpenter. I think he had the idea that he was going to direct it, but he ended up doing Christine instead. So he ended up just giving the script off to somebody else. Uh, it's Michael Pere, who is from Eddie and the Cruisers, and... Uh, Streets of Fire and Karen, or not, sorry, Nancy Allen, who was from Robocop. <laughs> uh, and it's about the Philadelphia Experiment thing that happened where there was like a radar jamming system that was trying to be developed or was being developed in like World War II. And it was a failure in reality. In the movie, it actually cloaks, physically cloaks a battleship. But the thing is, when you are cloaked, it's not like you're just invisible, you're in another dimension. <laughs> And two of the guys who were sailors on the ship jump overboard while it's in that other dimension and end up jumping forward in time to 1984, and they're trying to find a way to get back. And it's actually pretty cool. I like it a lot. It's really dark and, like, 
I don't think there's any humor in this movie at all. I'm not complaining. It was really cool. I liked it a lot. We saw it in the theater when I was a kid, and I've been a fan ever since. My mother, this is one of her favorite movies as well. I just wish we got a high def version of it. And it definitely does have John Carpenter feel a John Carpenter style of feel to it, although it does not have like the typical John Carpenter downer ending. But uh, if you like John Carpenter stuff, I highly recommend recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it before. And this is another movie from. Oh, I should probably talk about this. Um, I should have talked about this before. Philadelphia Experiment. Womp womp. Anyway, I have this on Blu-ray, but I have a DVD edition of this because my brother met the director and was planning. It was almost going to work with him on a project, and my brother told him that I really liked his previous movie. So he was just kind of like, oh, want me to sign something for him or whatever? And my brother was like, yeah, I'm sure he'd like that. So he texted me, and he's like, I'm at the director of that film, his house, and he's asking me if he if he would like a autographed something or other from him from from the movie. And I was just kind of like, uh, yeah, it's free. And sure enough, this showed up in the mail, and it's uh, Outlander. If you've ever seen the movie Outlander, it's not the TV show, uh, the, uh, the soccer mom porn show. <laughs> This has Jim Caviezel, Sophia Miles, Ron Perlman, and John Hurd in it. It's about an alien who crash lands on Earth when the Vikings were still running around. And uh, he, was, he had like a, a, an alien creature in his cargo that he was bringing back to the home planet because it like murdered a bunch of people on the planet. He was bringing it back for execution. And it gets loose during this time period. And he teams up with a bunch of Vikings to take it down. Excuse me. And uh, this is another movie by the Wine Scenes that they kind of they kind of intentionally released in like ten theaters because they just wanted to release it direct to video. And I was I ended up seeing it in the theater opening weekend. I thought it was pretty fun and, and entertaining. So um, yeah, he ended up sending me this signed copy that says "Thanks, Chris. Thanks for or, to Chris. Thanks for being a fan." Uh, it's signed by uh, Howard McCain. Is that what it is? McCain? Yeah, McCain. So I have this on one of my shelves, just kind of like displayed. Not a big fan of Jim Caviezel, but I think he's okay in this. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep that on the side so I can put that back on the shelf when I'm done. This is an import that is region free. I got from China, I think. And it, if you look at it, you can kind of tell what it is. It's Shaolin Soccer. This is uh, one of what's his name, Stephen. Okay, what's his name? Stephen. Oh, Jesus, I can't remember. The guy that did Hong Kong, or was it uh, Kung Fu Hustle? Stephen Chow. Uh, this is the movie that he made before Kung Fu Hustle. So, essentially, it's just a bunch of weird CGI, and, and like, um, the soccer games in this are, like, if they were part of a video game where, like, someone kicks the ball so hard that it whips up a tornado <laughs> and goes, like, flying and arcing through the air kind of thing. It's really funny. Like, the, the goalie on... Uh, Stephen Chow's team thinks he's uh, Bruce Lee, and he dresses just like Bruce Lee does in all the different movies. And there's a scene where someone kicks a ball that is it. He kicks it so hard that the friction of it flying through the air sets it on fire. And when the guy goes to block it, it ends up burning all of his clothes off while he's like blocking it in the air with his like fist. You see his clothes get like shredded off and burnt off. It's like silly, goofy, funny. It's like a sports movie if it was made by the director of The Mask. But I thought it was really, really entertaining, so I ended up finding a an original copy. I didn't want the American version of it because the Weinsteins, like I keep on saying, sliced the movie up to ribbons. I got the original Chinese cut, so I'm just glad that it was region free. So I had to have a copy of that. It's a lot of fun. One day you'll name a movie I have seen. Well, these are just the DVDs. These are the random things that have never been released on high def. That's why they're still here, because unless they get a release on high def, I will not get rid of them. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to hear or knows about the ones that I'm going to talk about next. This is all new. Well, this is going to be the one that everybody knows, and that is the Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> I don't own any of the original trilogy on Blu-ray because I absolutely hate the special editions. I like. I remember going to the theater and I saw each one of the special editions as they were released in the 90s. And each one of them, I was like, what the hell? Like, you took what was a great movie. I mean, even though I think Return of the Jedi is probably the weakest of the original trilogy, still, I was like, it's still fun as hell. It's great. Why did you do this to these movies? You are ruining them. They are putting pointless, stupid shit in them that didn't need to be there. The movies didn't need to be changed to begin with. That whole scene with uh, Jabba in A New Hope, where... 
originally was just a guy in a fat you know, a fat dude like wearing like uh, like a fur coat or whatever. And the reason why Han Solo ends up like walking over Jabba's tail in the new version of it is because he was talking to a dude originally. It was supposed to be just a guy, and he kind of like Han circled him while they were talking. Well, in the footage, instead of having Jabba spin around to face him the whole time, they put this stupid gag in of Han Han Solo walking over his tail. You think that Jabba would put up with that shit if that was real? Jabba would have shot his face off. It makes no sense. This stuff is so stupid and pointless. I hate it. So why do I have this set on DVD? Because even though these are the special edition versions, as extras on each one of these discs is the original version of each of the movies. They're not anamorphic at all. They're like windowed, but they are widescreen, and they are the original versions of the movies before Lucas changed anything, including the fact that the first movie isn't even called A New Hope. It's just called Star Wars, and then the, the, the crawl starts. There is no episode four, A New Hope. These are the original unaltered versions on here. And I will not get rid of these until like Lucasfilm and Disney get off their ass and high def versions of the original versions of the movies and not those god awful special editions that I just cannot stand. So this like box set, this steel book box set, I will not get rid of until those come out. Which is why this is still in my collection. So original films just called Star Wars. It's, no, it wasn't called a new up, it was just called Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, all uncut. They made Jabba smaller in a new hub. Yeah, well, he's supposed to be, like, younger or whatever, but it makes no sense. None of that makes any sense. All that stuff that they put in makes no sense. Why, why? The Jabba Palace scene with the singing was stupid to begin with. They made it even worse in the new version and felt the need to put that pointless character Boba Fett in even more of it. I keep seeing the screen flash over here. Is the stream looking okay? I hate it. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Speaking of Star Wars, one of the first projects that I ever did film-wise, uh, when I actually, instead of making like stupid little, like, until 2002, all the movies that I had made were made with like a handy cam, not going to handy cam, but like my dad's old VHS camcorder, and like this PXL 2000 thing my parents bought me and my brother for Christmas one year that was from Fisher Price that ran on high bias audio tapes that filmed everything in black and white and it was all pixelated and all that. We made stupid little dinky movies with no scripts. We just made it up as we went. Everything was ad lib kind of thing. We never had any kind of scripts for any of it. Uh, and then we made like I made a fan film for Shadow Run with my dad's VHS camcorder that we kind of sort of scripted, but it was mostly based off the Shadow Run Super Nintendo game. Even though we never actually beat the game, we based the movie off of it and made up the rest of it since we hadn't seen the ending yet. Oh, it's okay. I can't see what that is, Peter. The little symbols just show up over here. There's some buffer. Yeah, it keeps flashing over here. I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, one day I decided I've been watching a bunch of Star Wars fan films online on the uh, StarWars.com website, I think it was. Or no, the Force.net. The Force.net had a big Star Wars fan film community, and there were some really good ones being made. And I was just kind of like, "Well, I have a brand new computer." I, like so, in two thousand and two, I bought a brand new Sony VAIO that was like the top of the line Sony VAIO, and it could do all the editing stuff. I just needed to get some of the software and get a camera and all that kind of stuff to to do something. And I was making plans on making something. I didn't know what it was going to be, and then I started watching all these fan films. I'm like, you know what? Maybe this will be something to get people excited to, to make a film with me. So I'll do a Star Wars fan film. And I only wrote it as one movie. And then when I let everybody read it, they were like, no, you need to continue this and make it into like a trilogy. I was like, I don't want to do three of them. And they're like, no, dude, like you really need to expand on this because it has a lot of potential to go in different directions. I'm like, okay. And I did. I ended up making three scripts that went through multiple, multiple versions. Uh, and in 2002, we shot Star Wars Pathways Chapter 1, Path of Betrayal. And I will admit, it is not good. This is the first thing I did where I was like trying to be serious about filmmaking. Like, I went and like read a whole bunch of books on what you needed to do, and found as much equipment as I possibly could to make things look professional. Like, uh, I I met a dude on the Force.net forums that like didn't even know me. Like, we had never met before, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll give you my camera." He had like a really expensive, like $3,000 DV cam. 
that was like professional grade and a professional grade uh, tripod and a professional grade dolly that the tripod would would connect to for no money. He was just kind of like, yeah, your your project sounds pretty cool. I'll, I'll if you want, I can loan you the the, the camera. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> and sure enough, he did. And as a gift, I or as a return, I gave him a part in the third movie. Um, but yeah, like we made this in two weekends. It was like the Saturday and Sunday one weekend. And the next weekend we filmed it in December. Some of it was filmed outside in like negative degrees. Like the costume of my buddy Justin ended up sticking to his body. It was so cold out. Uh, and then, yeah, we made two more. We filmed the second one. I have a version of it available in rough cut form on my YouTube channel here. If you go way back to the beginning of my YouTube channel, you'll see the rough cut of part two. Part one is still on the force.net's website. It's still out there. Uh, and the third one, we couldn't finish filming because just as we're about to wrap up uh, the end of the movie, like the final fight scene, which we've been prepping for for about a year, uh, the lead actress hurt her back at work and she couldn't continue. So, like, the movie never got finished. Eventually, I'll edit the, the some of the scenes together. I've already edited together one scene. If you go way back on my channel, you'll see a fight scene from the third one, which we we're really proud of that took us like a year and a half to choreograph. But like I said, this one is not good. This is the warm-up. This is like the setup for everything that's going to happen in 2 and 3. It's just very basic. Uh, it only has four characters. Each one after this got bigger with more characters and more plot lines. Um, but like I said, you have to start somewhere. I learned a lot making this. I learned what to do and what not to do and how to talk to actors and how to work with special effects and how to wrangle special effects people and get crews together and like how to manage your money and props and costumes and all that kind of shit. So I learned a lot making it. It didn't end up exactly the way I wanted it to because of inexperience, but I like to say that they got better as we went. And like I right nowadays, I'm pretty good at what I do. The pirate flag. The video is freezing. I have it plugged in through the, uh, uh, ethernet. <laughs> Excuse me. I did have fun making it. Like I said, I learned a lot. I, it was basically like going to film school. Uh, and it just put me under a lot of stress. <laughs> but like I said, the actors got better with each movie, even though they were my personal friends. Like everybody that's in this picture is somebody that I knew. This guy was the dungeon master who was the DM for the Dun Dungeons and Dragons group that I was in. My buddy Charlie here in the back, I've known him since junior high. My buddy Justin, I'd known since 2000, and I was working with him. And Rob, back here, is a friend of Charlie and Marin, who are in the D&D group. I knew, I knew him through these two in the D&D group. And uh, they're all Star Wars fans. So the moment I said, hey, I'm, I'm planning on doing like a Star Wars fan film, are you interested? And everybody was just like, yes, even though they had no real acting experience. But each person got better as we went. This one I do have on Blu-ray. It did get a Blu-ray release. I didn't get rid of the DVD version because the DVD version is still better than the Blu-ray. The DVD or the Blu-ray looks better. It keeps. I see it keep on flickering. Something's going on with my internet, probably. I might have to reboot the uh, the router or whatever. I'm getting a new router, so maybe that's it. Maybe this one's crapping out. Um, the Blu-ray that I have of this movie definitely looks better. But the sound is effed up. Like, bad. I've seen this movie more times than I can count. I absolutely love it. I saw this movie in the theater in, like, was it 80? I think it came out in 86, and it was in 3D. And it was absolutely fantastic. It's a ripoff of Star Wars, but I absolutely love it. And I know this movie back to front. And I can, like, the way my ears work is I can tell when something is off. And, like, I'm pretty sure Peter can do this, too. Um, I can tell when the audio is off because I've heard the way the audio is in this version of the movie so many times that when I was watching the Blu-ray, I'm like, the audio is so weirdly mixed here. Why is it that there's sound effects missing from the movie? And still, is it, is it the, the sound mix all screwed up? Like the stereo mix? Did they try to mix it into 5.1 forgot to put like a channel in there or something like that? I don't know. So I kept the DVD version because the DVD version has the best sound mix. And that is Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin. This is an animated film, like I said. It is a complete ripoff of Star Wars. It has Jedi in it, but they're called uh, Kakans, which I think is a... Is it a Mormon? I think it's a Mormon term for something, actually. Kakan. Um, there is a Darth Vader type right here named... Uh, what is his name? Zor? Uh, God damn it. Zygon. 
I almost blanked on that for a second. Zygon, who wears a big mask like Vader does. The only thing is he actually takes it off when he, in certain scenes. There's a princess. <laughs> There's a lightsaber. Uh, it's basically a hilt that this slave finds who is working in a, uh, uh, a crystal mine. He finds it while he's mining one day, and there, it's a hilt but no blade, and a, a Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost, like Force Ghost, comes out and says, hey, you guys, your people were not meant to be here. You're meant to be on the surface, you know, living your lives. Use this hilt to find your way out. And basically, whenever he needs there to be a blade in the hilt, it shows up. It's like a lightsaber, and it cuts through anything. And it's definitely, it turns into a giant Star Wars type of scenario where it's like an empire versus like a rebellion and all that kind of stuff. It is a huge ripoff. There's a Han Solo character named Dag um, uh, who talks just like Han Solo, except he has a cigar in his mouth all the time. Um, that is played by Samantha Carter's dad from Stargate SG-1. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think who else is... Uh, uh, there's a, the, the ship that Dag is in is called Arthur, and it has an attitude just like, R2, like a C-3PO. It, it's, it talks smack all the time. And then he kidnaps a female robot to hold it for ransom, but he ends up reprogramming her, and he reprograms her through her ass, which is very problematic. And makes her subservient to him, which is very problematic. She's kind of like R2-D2 in the movie. Uh, it's Like I said, total Star Wars ripoff, but it is super fun. The characters are really likable. And uh, I had a, I've always enjoyed this one. I think it's great. If you have not seen it, try to check it out somewhere. I think you can rent it on Amazon. So if you're a Star Wars fan, check it out. <laughs> you thought it was Spaceballs? For some reason, that does not seem like something in one of those piles, but it is one of the few Blu-rays that you want. Star, Star, uh, Star Chaser? It is on Blu-ray, like I said. It's just like I said, the sound mix is all effed up. This is probably the newest DVD that I bought. It's still sealed. Uh, actual movie. And it's called The Station Agent. This is the first thing I ever saw Peter Dinklage in. Um, it's like a drama comedy, I guess. Oh, Spaceballs? <laughs> I do have space balls. It's on 4K. Um, so basically, Peter Dinklage works at like a, a model train store, and the owner dies, and he leaves Peter Dinklage's character this like train depot in the middle of New Jersey somewhere. And since he has no income anymore, he ends up moving into the train depot. And while he's there, he makes friends with a guy who owns a food truck who just does not shut up. Peter Dinklage barely talks in this movie. He just likes to keep to himself. And then there's this woman who shows up to the uh, food truck to get coffee all the time who was like going through like grief because her I think it was her son died her husband and her son died and they all kind of become this like weird family unit and I really really like it it's really well written I love all the characters it's so good never been released on high def in any way so the only way I can get it is on blu-ray and I found this on Amazon for like five bucks so I was like you know what might as well here is another training video that I made for my previous employer. This is the one that I had, This out of all the film projects I've done, all of them, I think I had the best time making this one because where I told you I had restrictions when I made that 5S one, we were not allowed to swear, we had to hit certain like points in the movie, we had to keep it dead serious the whole time, there could be no humor, even though I did insert some humor into the end credits with like bloopers and stuff. Um... And, like, we needed to keep it serious because the idea was we were going to distribute the movie company-wide. Like, it went through all of GE. This one was specifically for our site. And I was told by the guy who ran the facility, since this one is going to be specifically for our site, we can do whatever the hell we wanted as long as there was no sex in it. It was basically the way he worded it. You can do whatever you want as long as there's no sex. We could swear. We could show violence. Uh, we could do crazy stuff in restricted areas if we wanted to. As long as we got the point across... And it wasn't too far off of, you know, off the rails. It was going to be okay. So I made this. And like I said, it was the most fun I ever had in a film project. It's called Swims, a mockumentary. Swims is an anagram of a way that you, because the place I worked at, we were working with radioactive materials. It was like radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's a way of when you find a spill, how you deal with it. Swims was like uh, deal with self, deal with yourself first if there's a spill. 
warn other people uh, about the spill, investigate, find out where the spill came from or what, what happened, minimize is clean it up, and survey is make sure that there is no lasting effects. And uh, it was made up by one of the guys who worked in the health physics department, this anagram, and they wanted to use it as a training tool to train other people in case this we did have a spill of some kind. So we ended up making it like a, a mockumentary since a lot of the people that were in this were in a band outside of work, and we decided to like make it like Spinal Tap. <laughs> so that's why it's a mockumentary. So it's about a rock band who sings about radioactive accidents. <laughs> And their newest song is Swims, and it's all about the process of doing this thing. And like I said, we went off the freaking rails. We show people getting into fist fights in restricted areas. Uh, there's a lot of cursing. Not not horrible cursing, but like cursing. Um, it's Some of the jokes are just like stupid as all hell. One character right here. Mumbles just like that dude from King of the Hill. He copies that exactly. Um, there's a lot of like weird jokes that people did in the background while we're filming scenes. Like the guy back here in the red who's the drummer. There's this scene where we're interviewing one of the people in the exercise room we had at the job. And in the back he's doing this really awkward uh, like stretching routine while he's wearing like booty shorts. And I, I never asked any of them to do that. He's decided to start doing it himself. And I was just kind of like, that is too funny to not have in the movie. So it's in there. So when the movie was done, I had a bunch of test screenings at work to make sure that people thought that it was actually good. Like, does it work as a, as a film? Does it work as a training tool? And also to see if it was appropriate for work. And I got absolute across the board, like five stars from everybody. I was like, that's probably the best training thing I've ever seen. It is so much fun to watch because we had so much fun making it. Everybody had a good time making it. And then HR saw, and HR was like, you cannot show that to people. Absolutely not. You're showing people fighting in the restricted areas and stupid stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, but the reason they're fighting is it causes a spill, and then we go into the whole thing, the whole point of the movie. And they're like, no, you can't show that to anybody. So it never actually got released, but everybody in the facility saw it because of the test screenings that I had. <laughs> but no new employees ever saw it. So absolutely loved making that one. I have such great memories of that. And here's another movie, and that is Time Code. Time Code is an experimental movie by Mike Figgis, who did One Night Stand. And I think it was Leaving Las Vegas. I think he directed Leaving Las Vegas. Um, so the whole idea behind this is you're watching four movies at the same time. So you see the way the screen, this picture is, where it's like the four different color pictures are split up like that. That's what the movie looks like while you're watching it. There's four people being, there's four cameras running at the exact same time following a bunch of different characters. And at during points in the movie, they cross paths and stuff like that. It's like a, a dark, a black comedy drama kind of thing. It's about a bunch of people that are working for a movie company. And there's like characters that are having affairs with each other and other stupid shit going on. And it's really interesting. It's like, like I said, it's very experimental. Like nothing had been done like that before that I had seen. I saw it in the theater and it was like kind of mind blowing, honestly, that like it worked. Uh, it has a great cast. It's got Saffron Burroughs, who you've probably seen in like, she was in the wing commander movie, deep blue sea, uh, Salma Hayek, Gene Triplehorn, who was in basic instinct, Stellan Skarsgård, Holly Hunter, uh, Steven Weber, uh, Danny Houston, who you probably see he's in the new crow trailer. He plays the villain in the new crow trailer for the, the new remake that's coming out. Um, I'm trying to think. There's uh, the guy who played the warlock. Uh, Julian Sands is in it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else that I recognize. Oh, she was in uh, George of the Jungle. She played the love interest in George of the Jungle. She's in this. Uh, but whatever. It is really interesting, and I. I remember, like, I would watch this, like, once a week when it came out on home video because, like, for some reason, watching the four different things, the way it works also is it's not like you're listening to four movies at the same time. It's not like everybody's talking over each other with the four different movies. If there's one of the, 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 the pains of information that you need to focus on, the audio will lower the, for the other ones, and you'll just focus on one for a while because, like, oh, the affair thing is happening right now. You need to pay attention to that and stupid, stupid 
shit is just happening in the other ones that you don't really need to. But there's an extra on here where you can control which one of the panes you want to you want to listen to. So you can control which one, and it's really interesting. So also, um, they filmed the entire movie at once with four different cameras. Everything was like timed up, and they have the first version of that happening where everything is completely different. Characters are got moved around by the you know as they went, and the final version is the one that's in the movie. The final. Uh, time they did it. It's really interesting and really cool movie. I really like it a lot. It needs to get a high def treatment. Yep, the the trailer dropped this week. Humor restricted. Yep, yeah, the trailer for the new Crow movie dropped this week. It has uh, Skarsgård in it. Uh, the guy who played Pennywise in uh, the It movies that came out a few years ago. He plays uh, the lead in it. He plays Eric Draven. It looks interesting. Did it need to be made? No, but I'll go see it. So my brother, I talked about him being like a filmmaker in Hollywood. Uh, when he first got out of college, when he first got out of film school, he and a bunch of his film school friends created this company called You Press Play. And we're making a bunch of content for a You Press Play website in hopes that people in Hollywood would see all of it and start offering them jobs. And they also started accepting short films and films and music videos from other people in Chicago. And we're trying to become like a Chicago filmmaking hub kind of thing. Didn't really work. Uh, but I met a bunch of the people that were working for, like made films for the website through my brother being a part of it. I ended up with some of my stuff on there as well. I did my machinima halo machinima show ended up getting posted there. Uh, and it went crazy popular. Like, I am not kidding. It went so through the roof on that website that it started to overshadow a lot of the other stuff that was on the channel and pissed off a lot of the people that were there. Uh, you Press Play ended up getting a table in an anime convention because the big thing that they had was a short film, uh, a, a zombie horror comedy short film there called Stay Dead. And they were trying to advertise it to the kids at the uh, anime convention. Well... Because I was doing this machinima thing with Halo, uh, the guy who ran the website was like, come to the convention and you can show off your Halo thing there too. And when they were playing the zombie movie stuff, people just kept walking past the table, didn't pay any attention. The moment we put on some of the stranded stuff, the Halo machinima thing, people were stopping and asking what that was. Like, is that is that red versus blue? I'm like, no, it's this thing called stranded. And I told them what it was all about. And they're like, oh, that actually sounds kind of funny. It's nothing like red versus blue. Okay, cool. Where can I see it? Go to you, press play. Cool. The moment they put the zombie movie back on, people just started walking past the table again, not paying him any attention to the point where they just ended up keeping the, stra the stranded stuff on all the time. And then the guy who wrote and directed Stay Dead came to the table and got mad that we were focusing on that instead of his movie. And he like forced the guy who ran the website to take my movie off and put his movie on instead. And he was just kind of like, look, his machinima thing is bringing people to the table. Yours is not. So how about we use that to bring people to the table, and then you can pitch them your Stay Dead movie. And he's just like, no, no, no. And I just ended up going like, well, you know what? If you're going to be a dick like that, I'm just going to leave. And I did. And they said nobody came to the table after I left. <laughs> yeah. So um, this, these are two compilations of the things, the, the, the short films and music videos that were on the Upress Play website back in the late 90s and early 2000s. So I have the Upress Play Volume 1 and Upress Play Volume 2. And you could only buy these from the website at the time. But since my brother was like a co-founder of Upress Play, I got these for free. So the first one has that Stay Dead movie that I was talking about, the zombie comedy, which is actually really funny. Uh, Behind the Werewolf, which is like a mockumentary horror thing. Caleb's Cube. Uh, Court Jester is the band. My brother directed a music video for this band called Court Jester. And that's them. It's uh, The song is called... Uh, what is it? Stand... Stand Up is the name of the song. Court Jester is the name of the band. And Die the Sky, which I don't think I've actually watched. So it's got five different things on it. And then Volume 2 has Two Days in Limbo, which is the World War II short film my brother made as his final for film school. Uh, Roscoe Village, which is a pilot for a proposed TV show that takes place in Roscoe Village, which is like a town in Chicago, or like an area in Chicago, like a village, I guess you want to call it, or whatever, a neighborhood in Chicago, which is actually kind of funny. 
Uh, Back to Reality, which is another one of my brother's short films. Soldier, which is another one of my brother's short films. Terror Vision and... What does that say? Marazine, which is a music video. So I had to get those just to have them because the website is not in existence anymore, so I'm glad I actually have them archived somewhere. And then we have this. Who wants some hentai? <coughs> I'm not into hentai. I like anime. I don't like hentai. I have this because of the story behind when I watched it. And I've told this plenty of times in the past. I'll tell it again for the new people here. That I know Peter's probably heard this before. So the, the hentai is called Yuratsuka Doji. So when anime first started popping up in the early 90s in the U.S., me and my bro- my buddy Charlie, who was in that Star Wars fan film, uh, really heavily got into it. So we started off with Akira and then ended up going to Fist of the North Star and Vampire Hunter D, Ranma One Half, um, uh, th- Three by Three Eyes, uh, The Giver, and we just, everything that was coming out, we were like, I got to see it, I got to see it, I got to see it. Perf- uh, what was it called? Perfect, not Perfect Blue, um, Silent Mobius. All these things that were coming out, we're like, every single one of them we wanted to watch. So there was this comic shop near our homes that was getting all the new anime as it came out. So one day the two of us went there after work to see what was out, and this we saw this thing on the shelf called Yuratsuka Doji. And it was, it was called Legend of the Overfiend was the subtitle. Yep, Overfiend, hell yes. So we're looking at the box, and across the front it has this like strip that says, Absolutely Not for Children. And on the back, it said that it was rated NC-17. This should not be viewed by anybody under the age of 17 because of like it was like graphic adult themes and stuff like that. And, and immediately, we're both kind of like, got to see it. It's NC-17. It's adult stuff. Let's go check it out. There's probably some sex in it. Oh, is there? So we go back to Charlie's place. Charlie lived with his dad and his grandmother. His dad was at work. Grandmother was home. We didn't know what this was. So we pop it on in the living room. And we're sitting there watching it with Grandma sitting behind us on the couch. We're sitting on the floor in front of the television. And she's sitting on, like, this recliner in the back of the room. We watch this freaking hentai. Beginning to end. There's flopping demon dicks all over the place shooting laser spooge. And, like, this teacher's jaw rips open and she has, like, a dick tongue. And, it like, it molests a girl. And it's like, we're just like, what is happening in this freaking movie? It is nuts. There's, it's it's really uncomfortable to watch. There's, like, rapes and stuff going on in it. We were not prepared. Grandma didn't say a goddamn thing the entire movie. Not one thing. We're sitting there going, like, when your dad gets home... I'm looking at Charlie. I'm like, when your dad gets home, he is going to hear about this from your grandmother, and I'm going to be banned from coming over here ever again. And he's just kind of like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. The movie ends. Grandma gets up folds up the blanket or the the quilt that she was using and puts it on the couch and goes and makes dinner. So dad comes home and we all sit down to dinner because I was, I was staying, I was like going to be there until like nine o'clock that night because we were going to make a movie with a little, my little uh, Fisher Price camera after that. And uh, we're sitting down to dinner and I'm eating, Charlie's eating, his dad's eating, grandma's not eating anything. She's just sitting there looking at her food. And after about 10 minutes of this, Charlie's dad looks at her and goes, Graham, what's wrong? And she's just kind of like, I don't have an appetite. And he's like, why? And she goes, you won't eat anything either if you've seen the things I've seen. And we all went, and I like was d- taking a drink of whatever it was, lemonade or whatever, and I shot it out my nose. <laughs> and I could not stop laughing. And Charlie's dad is like, what? what's going on? And Charlie's like, I, we, we watched an an, a new anime today, and it was a little adult. And he goes, what do you mean by like a little adult? And he's like, a lot adult. And he tried to describe what it was without saying that there was, like, triple dong demon wieners flopping around and shooting Lestructo laser jizz and stuff. So, it was so funny. And, naturally, when Part 2 came out, we bought it, or I bought it, and we're like, well, let's not watch that one at your house. This one has the first two movies on it. There's four total. Uh, the first one is the longest one, Legend of the Overfiend. There's a sequel called the... Oh, God, what is the second one? The... Death, the death rape machine or something like that. And so we went to my house to watch it. And the way things worked at my house was we have, it's a three-level house, right? 
we have a TV with a VCR in the living room on the main floor. And then in the basement, there's another entertainment center with a TV and a VCR down there. So we're like, my mom never, my, like my dad was at work. My mom never comes downstairs unless she has to do laundry or something. So I'm like, we'll go down in the basement. My mom will never bother us at all. And guess what happens? We're in the middle of watching it. And my mom decides she's going to do some laundry. So there's this scene happening where these two demons are fighting while they're flying over the, uh, the was it the San Francisco Bay? Right. And one of the demons is a male. The other one is a female. And the, demon, the male demon has a three-pronged wiener. And he's banging the female demon while they're flying through the air fighting. And there's an interior shot of her cervix, <laughs> of her uterus. And you see the three-dong dick just banging away. That's when my mom decides to walk downstairs to do laundry. And see, she sees this going on. And she kind of like stops and like cocks her head. She's like, what are you watching? And I just like instantaneously, I'm like, children's programming. And she goes, whatever. And just goes and does the laundry and walks back upstairs. And I was like, God damn. <laughs> These movies are strange. They are very uncomfortable to watch sometimes. But I bought this because it the memory of the thing with the grandmother and my mom. They're not great. They have the first one does have a cool story if it wasn't for all the weird sex stuff going on in it. It's interesting and dark, uh, and the second one does too. But it's just like all the weird sex stuff in it. I don't know if I could actually sit through them again, but I like I said, I have this for the memories. <laughs> Grandma's down with some anime titties. <laughs> a secret super fan is gonna live in your head rent free forever. <laughs> Two TVs. Guy must be rich. No. <laughs> Two TVs because the bottom TV was holding the second TV up. <laughs> no, we had like a we had a big TV in the living room with a VCR, and then we had like a smaller TV downstairs that my dad would watch because he had his personal computer down there, and he'd be like playing video games on it while he's watching TV or whatever. So like the only unless my dad was home, nobody was in that basement other than me and my brother normally. Um, and then, like, I ended up getting a TV, like I said, in my room and all that. But, yeah, that's the reason why I have that movie is that memory. <laughs> like I said, the movies aren't good. Uh, here we have another television show. Well, actually, no. That's, I should probably talk about this. I already talked about Tron before, but I have the um, Tron 2-disc set 20th Anniversary Collector's Edition on DVD. And this is a, basically the Laserdisc version of Tron ported over to DVD. So the Laserdisc version of Tron had two or three Laserdiscs in the set. And it came in a really thick box, too, because they filmed hours and hours and hours of, of additional like uh, documentary footage of, or interviews and stuff. There was like a lot of special features on that set. The movie was on the first disc, and then the last two discs were all extras. They had interviews with everybody from the movie, including Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges like put his... He still has the helmet that he wears in the in the computer world, like as a, uh, on a, at his house, he owns it. And he like puts it on and he's like, I'm ready for make for Tron too. Let's make it happen. Movie didn't happen for like another 15 years. <laughs> but like I said, if you don't have the laser disc version, this is the version to have. It has all those rad ass extras. You can see how much of it is here. So I found this at half price books. So I had to add it to my collection. There's also like a bare bones one that came out when DVD first came out that I need to find as well. These all must be sorted by genre. No, I have these all alphabetical. Uh, Tron is separate because I have all my Tron stuff in one place. That's why I keep forgetting. And the Outlander is in another place because it's just on display. It's not actually in the uh, on the shelf. But another television show that was on around the same time as Friday the 13th was War of the Worlds. This is two seasons of the show. I used to watch this every week until the second season ruined it. <laughs> So this is a direct continuation of the War of the Worlds movie that came out in the 50s. It takes place in real time as a sequel to that movie. Um, all the aliens that died because of the bacteria in the air at the end of the movie were all, like, taken out of their ships. The, the ships were put, like, in storage somewhere, like in Area 51. All the bodies were, like, placed in these, like, you know, barrels and sealed. And eventually, like, a radiation... Like there was a bunch of there was like a terrorist attack on Area Fifty One, and some sort of radiation was unleashed, and it like revived all the corpses. And now they have the ability, in order to save money for the show, to like take over a human person's body and live inside their body, so you don't have to see aliens running around all the time. And they don't have to worry about makeup effects. 
And there's like a team of, it's almost like the X-Files, where there's like a team of scientists that have been tasked with tracking down all the missing aliens and like get them back in those cans or kill them all before they try to take over the planet again. That's the first season. And the show's actually really, really fun. It's All the characters are really likable. Um, the, it's another one that's like, this was actually shown like on Saturdays around like 1 or 2 p.m. And this one was graphic as hell, too. All these Canadian shows that were like really popular in the 80s, like Friday the 13th and this, got away with a lot of gore for like a primetime show, kind of. Uh, but I loved it. And then the second season, for some reason, they decided to revamp it and like set it in like an ap- post-apocalyptic future after the aliens have already taken over. And there's a new version of the aliens out there. And there's like this big mother brain thing that controls them all. And it is just stupid. And the first season is the way to go. But the show is actually really fun. I like it a lot. And it still holds up. I A lot of these shows, like Friday the 13th and War of the Worlds, I was really worrying that even though I liked them as a kid, I wouldn't like them as an adult, and surprisingly, they still hold up, so I'm glad that that is still pretty good, even though that second season is absolute crap. And the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight is Wicked Wicked. So I've never heard of it. I had never heard of this movie before uh, until I went to... There's a, there's a movie theater, like an old-school movie theater that has like an organ and an organ player on the weekends... Um, there's a theater by me that, that uh, plays nothing but older movies on the weekends. They, I, I went and saw the original Psycho there. I saw the Birds there. Tippy Hedren was there when I saw it to like do a Q and A afterwards. Um, I saw Forbidden Planet there. But every Halloween they do a 24 hour film festival called uh, the Music Box of Horrors. <clears throat> All the movies are shown on film, back to back. Like it starts at noon on Saturday and it ends at noon on Sunday. And I have gone, well, I haven't gone there the last couple of years because it's been selling out before I can actually get a freaking ticket. But uh, I want to say for like three years in a row, I went. And one, I think it was like the second year that I went, the, one of the last movies they played, it was like Sunday morning around like nine in the morning. They played this thing called Wicked Wicked. And I, like I said, I'd never heard of it before. But all the friends that I was with who had gone home around like midnight the night before, to get some sleep, came back to the theater. I stayed the entire 24 hours. They came back to the theater because they wanted to watch this, and I think the last movie that year was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the film. Uh, So what this is is kind of like watching Time Code, where that has like four movies playing at once. This is two movies at once. They call it Duo Vision. You can see right here. So it takes place in a hotel. There's like a murderer loose in the hotel. And the murderer is targeting women. And there's this lounge singer girl that the killer has now targeted. There's a couple of cops running around trying to find out who it is. But they can't really stop the hotel from running because of the amount of people that are there. And so it's like you see the cops investigating at the same time you watch the serial killer going around doing his things on both screens. It's not like you're watching two. There's a couple times where you see different angles of the same scene when people cross. But for the most part, one of the screens is following the serial killer or the the uh, lounge singer, and the other one is following the detective as a, detectives as they are investigating. And it's actually really well made. It has uh, Armin Scheinerman in it, who played Quark on Deep Space Nine. It's like one of the first movies he has, and he has this really weird looking mullet thing. He plays a, a a bellhop at the hotel, and it has one of the funniest deaths for a bad guy in a movie ever, where basically. The cops have the killer cornered in the attic of the hotel, and there's an open window behind the killer, and the killer's sitting there going like, if you, if you, uh, what was it, if you come at me, I'll jump, I'll jump. And I think he had the the, uh, lounge singer, like, in a headlock. He's like, I'll jump, I'll jump. And one of the cops goes, oh, yeah, well, I dare you. And he goes, oh, yeah? And he lets go of the girl and turns around and just jumps out the window and, like, lands on a fence that, like, has, like, you know, the spires on it that, like, shoot through his chest. And it's like, we're, like, watching, like, what? They thought that was a good ending. The guy just goes, oh, yeah, you dare me? Fuck your dare. Jumps. It's actually really entertaining and really good. And the the lounge singer sings the Wicked Wicked title track on stage in the movie. And it's actually pretty cool. I like it a lot. Like, we were all curious about it because, you know, those gimmicky movies from, like, the 60s and the, the 50s, you know, they can be hit or miss. That one is actually one that really works. So, your TV used to be a little more free with artistic license. That has changed just the same music on the radio. Tons of language you would not hear on the U.S. radio in the 90s and early 2000s. 
Oh, in Canada? Well, you guys have like those porn stations too in Canada in like the 70s and 80s, right? Like after a certain time, some of the stations would turn into like porn stations. I remember like David Cronenberg talking about that. That's why Videodrome, Videodrome got made was because he was trying to make fun of that. Uh, but yeah, that's it for my DVD and quote unquote VHS collection, just the one VHS tape. But there, yeah, those are the only, yeah, in Canada. So that's it for the DVD collection. Next week, I will be back with my TV sets, my TV collections on Blu ray. And then we'll go into the box sets on Blu ray in the following stream. And then we'll just go head first into all of my Blu rays. And we'll do letter by letter. And then we'll move on to the 4Ks. So next week, TV on Blu-ray. That shouldn't be a long stream either. Although this was almost two hours. Like I said, I can talk movies for hours and hours and hours. As opposed to video games. Because uh, I'm more of a film person than a video game person. So these streams are going to be pretty long. I'm surprised that a lot of you have stayed. The, uh, Canadian Retro. I'm surprised. Retro Coop. I'm surprised you guys have stayed this long. I can just keep on going and going and going when it comes to movies. To the point where I'm probably going to be horse tomorrow. So next Thursday, 8.30 p.m. Central, I'll be back with the TV on Blu-ray stream. And like I said, on Saturday, I'll be streaming the D&D game Tides of Flame on Twitch. I'll put the link here again. That's the link to my Twitch channel. Give it a sub. Uh, not a sub, but like a follow. You don't have to, I don't, you don't, don't pay for it. Um, yeah, give it a follow. Give us a, give us a, or watch the stream because I'm trying to get the, what is it, the first tier of, what is it that they call it? Like when you, you have to like meet certain criteria to like be able to get, what is this, not associate or something like that? I can't remember what it's called. Anyway. Uh, yeah, check that out on Saturday. We're going to start streaming probably around 6.30 p.m. Central. And then also, my other YouTube channel, I do believe that's correct. Shh, the movie is starting is where my podcast, where we record a commentary track to a film with a guest, is now going to be hosted here on YouTube on that channel. So if you feel like it, go and give that one a sub. I've been releasing all the old episodes and we're finally nearing the end of the current ones. We're like, I'm on season six, I'm uploading season six and that's where we ended. And we are currently recording season seven right now. So once I have season seven or six uploaded completely, we'll start uploading the season seven new episodes. So check that out. Peter's been on it a few times. Uh, we gotta, we gotta pick up a, uh, or pick a new uh, extreme sports movie to watch because that's Peter's theme. Whenever he's on the show, we've watched Rad, Thrashing, Extreme Ops. We need a, another extreme sports movie to watch. <laughs> is there one? Uh, is there one about rollerblades? Oh, we already watched Prayer of the Roller Boys, but I think that was more ra roller skates. Vertical Limit. Oh, there you go. Vertical Limit's awesome. I actually own that on Blu-ray. Spoiler alert. So, thanks for showing up and hanging out with me tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. The fact that some of you showed up like for the entire stream is awesome. I will hopefully talk to you all next week. Or Airborne, we haven't watched that one yet. We haven't watched that at all. Seth Green on Rollerblades, oh shit. <laughs> Thrashing we've watched. Uh, thanks for coming and hanging out. I'll talk to you all later. Stay safe out there, everybody. I'll talk to you next time. Chris of Midlife Crisis Media, out. <laughs>